So, you know, the message that I actually had in my mind initially was Jesus the high priest. But somehow, as I was uh, working on my laptop, there was this talk I gave to a very secular, large gathering of young people. And somehow, I felt, no, I think I should be talking about this. So, I thought of handling this thing called handling peer pressure. Now, handling peer pressure is... Uh, a topic that uh, may look very, very casual, but it's so connected to everything that you heard this morning. It was so connected because it tells you the biggest problem that many, many of us face in our life today. So the first thing, what exactly is peer pressure? What exactly is peer pressure? It's a feeling that one must do the same thing as other people or one's age group or social group in order to be liked or respected by them. I put this picture of the zebra. You know, everybody wants to be like the zebra with stripes. You just feel that in my peer group, if this is what people are doing, if I don't belong to that group, I'm not cool. I'm not good enough. And then comes this problem of actually feeling that not only is it not good enough, maybe I'm missing something in life altogether. And the pressure can be so strong. So I have this very, very, very strong desire that I need to belong. Now, we may talk a lot of things. We may say, you know, I'm in this church group. I'm among friends. So what happens to many of us, we start leading parallel lives. Some people have three lives. One in the church, one among their friends in college or in their workplace, one in the family. I can be a totally perfect spiritual guy in the church, I do everything perfectly. I've got the right expression on my face. I say the right hallelujahs. I raise my hand. I do everything right. I can even bring out the right words. I go back home and I can be that perfect husband. I can be that perfect wife. I go back to my office place and I can be a devil in every way. We heard about the testimony. We heard last... Uh, Last Sunday, you know, when he talks about the girl that he wanted to marry and the family asking him, do you have your Bible and quoting the Bible, and later on they send somebody to kill him, you know. And this problem is so strong within us that we may not realize it, but we want to belong. And as we want to belong, it starts being seen in every walk of life. There are kids who want to commit suicide because they don't have the right kind of shoes. There are kids who would do anything for these shoes. And then we have got people who start feeling, hey, this is not enough. I've got to up it up a little more. And I want to have clothes. And clothes that are branded in the way that I'm recognized. For somebody, it may be something like a Levi. For somebody, it could be Armani. But the bottom line is, I am so hooked on to this concept that I cannot get out. And so, my happiness is in the pursuit of these things which I imagine make me belong. I feel I cannot connect to my college group because I don't have the right clothes. And the pressure is so enormous that I have nightmares and I got into depression. You start off with a bag that was functional. Very soon, you start off with bags because of the brands. And they never satisfy you because you feel, I need something better. So as you walk, you're looking at the other lady's stuff and wondering, hey, that's MK? Oh, this is LV. Some smart guy realized the only way to sell their product was putting the logos outside. When I was a kid, tailors had their labels inside the collar of the shirt. Somewhere down the line, somebody decided, you know, for my birthday, somebody gave me a belt 
with this huge thing written and I just don't know how to put it that on, you know. But the bottom line is that's what sells. And I feel, I feed my hunger, but it's not satisfying. I need more and I need more and I need more. And strangely, India is one of the leaders in the consumer market. So we had gone to one of the fancy stores in Europe and I was very surprised to see an Indian and a Chinese salesman there. See, I'm talking about Europe. This is in Rome, actually. So we asked that guy, hey, surprising to see. He said the only people who buy here are Indians and Chinese, sir. The Europeans have no money left. <laughs> he said, especially after the Ukraine, well, there's no money at all. So if you think that we are out of it, just forget it. Everybody in the industry feels that there's a huge population of Indians and if they touch one little dot, it's enough for them to run their businesses, okay? And the guys, if you thought, this is their drive. I want better and better and better gadgets. Very often, when I pick up mobile phones of guys, they don't even use 1% of that phone. They use it for three things. Women sell their bodies for phones. Just recently, I met a young constable. And I was talking to her about her life and she was saying, sir, my life is so miserable. I'm used by the politicians for this and that and all these things. But she said, but what troubles me most is not that, sir. It's the number of girls I catch in Racecourse Road after one o'clock in the morning. Sir, there are girls who just do this for phones, for clothes. And when I tell them, look, I'm not arresting you because your whole life is gone, so I find them back again there. Just for one mobile phone. Just for one clothes. I met a businessman just 10 days back, or his, his close friend. He was sitting with me and chatting, and he said something. And he said, you know, I want to show you one of my friends, friends, colleagues, or friends, partners. Girl after girl after girl. I said, how does he even do this? Oh, do you know that? These girls just want good holidays and clothes and fancy restaurants. Why do we do it? Somewhere down the line, I keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing myself in search of something that will never ever satisfy. When I grow up, Every guy's dream, can I up my bike a little more? Just this morning, I was listening to a talk. It's a talk that is given by uh, uh, Steve Jobs. Just a week or 10 uh, days before his death, and he says, I realize finally an expensive or a, poor, or a cheap car does the same thing. It goes on the same road reaches from one point to the other at the same time and I wonder was this all worth it at all but we feel that my neighbor has got it I gotta get it then the neighbor is unhappy because you have got it and you live in this unhappy world because every day you're doing things not because you want it but because you feel I need to belong right and women will buy clothes after clothes because this is the what the media tells you you are what you, what you wear. What your clothes reveal about is about your personality. Your style reflects your personality. And my, the world and its standards forces me to believe this lie. It comes in every direction. From billboards, from TVs, from your YouTube channel, wherever you look. There is this lie that keeps telling you that your identity is in these things. Your respect is from these things. The fact you belong is in these things and I cannot get. And then I have told you about this. The logos that are placed for the world to see. Each one of these brands are placed for the world to see that you can afford it, right? The guy who has got CK feels it's not good enough. He wants Hugo Boss. The one in HM feels this is cheap stuff. The one who's got Nike feels it's not good enough and he needs a polo. It just goes on in the cycle that's over and over again. I want you to ask this question. 
if I give you a, a say an Armani t-shirt with no logos on it, it's 200 bucks. And I give you, I'm giving you an Armani t-shirt at a discount price with the logo on for 5,000 bucks, which would you buy? How many of you this morning are feeling that I would invest 4,500 rupees for the logo? Because I believe, you know, I got into severe trouble once when I snipped the logo off a handbag. It was hanging on a rope. I just thought it looks funny, you know. That was big trouble. Because most of the money was in that little tag, not on the leather of the bag. My wife never forgave me for that. <laughs> she said, how could you ever do that? Incidentally, that's a bag she bought today. She's not here. There's no logos on that. I'm, maybe it's there it's somewhere in the back. I'm not saying don't buy it. You can buy it if you can afford it. It's fine. But don't let that be your desire, your ambition, your life, and your first love. This morning we talked as Jesus. Is he your first love? For many people, your first love is this. I'm saving. I'm saving. I'm so worried. I got this and I get that. And it goes on. So the question you have to ask yourself, is it really the truth? Is this my life that I want? And it spreads into every, every, every area of your life. I start believing my recognition comes from the car I drive. I drive an expensive car. Believe me, I do that. I badly need that to bring down my tax. You do that, it's okay. I get tax rebate on every component. On the interest of the car, so I take a loan. It's like saying instead of paying the government, as well blow it on yourself. Wilson can understand that. There's no other way. What else do you do? The government's made rules spend. But please don't buy this stuff if it has no value. It is not worth it. It's actually a headache because when it hits you, repairing is very, very expensive. But it spreads to every, every area of our life. My housewarming has to be gorgeous. You know? What will people say when they come to the house? Is my house better than anybody else who has come into the housewarming? What's my tiles? What's my glass? What's my furniture? Every single company. I'm obsessed with my looks, with my house, with my weight, with my color. And my life is totally destroyed because there is no peace in my life because this is what it is. The country in the world which sells the largest amount of fairness scheme is India. In tons. Because you believe that Indian friend, you know, India is the, the worst, the most crazy regeneration. They will tell you in shades. Don't go in the sun. You will lose two shades of color. I'm not joking. But you go in the west, they're so excited. Can you see my tan? If you don't see the tan, there is a problem. There, no? It's not like they are any better. Right? They need the tan. And, you would, and they come in the holiday weekend. Nobody's noticing the tan. They were, Do you see my tan? Oh, yeah, I noticed it, you know. And in India, we got problems. Mothers so worried, their daughters are lot half shade, two shade, three shades. They'll be comparing and say, did you see, oh, you went for the marriage, did you see that girl? She's two shades left. I have no idea about the shade card and how those gradings go. But those women seem to understand these shades so well, you know. Two, three, all of them figure out their mind extremely well. And inside this crazy world, I live. And so, I would invest any amount of money. You know, there's a kind of laser they do, which you can bring down your color. It lasts just for three three weeks. They do that just before the wedding. So the three weeks of honeymoon are over, she comes back to her true color. <laughs> when the surprise is over, you know, everything changes. Hmm? You heard of that joke? This lady, this, this guy who says, is this the lady I married? But you, when you woke up in the morning, you look so different. False eyelashes are gone, the hair locks were gone, the kind of, you know, all those foundations and the uh, stuff that you take to remove dots and particles and everything disappeared, you know. She looked totally different, radically different. And he had a big trouble now to say, like, is this the woman I married, you know, went to sleep, woke up, totally different, transformation, you know. <laughs> yeah, he says maybe the mobile phones cannot recognize you also some morning because he took it the other way. So this girl today, how many of you have watched the movie Barbie? Girls, anybody? No? It's totally on women's power. The Barbie doll was created to destroy the mind of 
women. Making you feel that this is the only kind of woman that should be appreciated. There is a massive industry in plastic surgery, makes tons of money just by changing you completely. People want to look radically different in every part of their body. So there are people who are unhappy because they look like this, depressed. Wake up morning after morning in depression and pathetic men who want to, don't want to marry such girls because they're only interested in how they look. You marry one of these, you're dead for life because first you don't get any food because she doesn't eat any food. And every morning, night, three times a day, you got to tell how beautiful and how gorgeous you look. You marry one of those, you'll get good food to eat and you're happy, seriously speaking. And you're worried about this. Why? Because of the insane peer pressure that we believe that there's only one type of girl that should be appreciated. And you think that is fine? This girl has got curly hair, she's unhappy and makes it straight. And the one with straight hair is so unhappy she goes and makes it curly. In the end of the day, you don't know what exactly does she want. The guy with black hair goes and makes it blonde. And the one with blonde hair makes it white because uh, black because he can never ever be satisfied in something that he's searching for which is not available in this world to give. And every guy and every girl thinks true happiness comes when he gets his perfect girlfriend or boyfriend, another lie, you know. Nothing in this world can give you the happiness that you're searching for. You destroy your life, you destroy your mental peace, you destroy your happiness, you destroy everything. You come to church, but your mind is not in church. You pray and you're praying for one of those. That's where most of our testimonies is getting one of those. Have you noticed that? I want to thank God. Why? Because, you know, he doesn't say I got a beautiful girlfriend, but he will at least tell you that, you know, I got the car I wanted, I want the house I wanted, I got this I wanted, I got a laptop I wanted, I got that. How many testimonies are there? God, I just want to praise you. I was a person who was challenged with this addiction and God released me from that. No, we never hear those testimonies. Every testimony is about, is about this pathetic dream of mine which has been fulfilled. And I say, I'm so grateful. Oh, I'm a success. I did this amazing stuff. Ask yourself where exactly and who exactly is the first night. And then crazy nights, you know, I don't know. I don't know your secret lives. You know the secret lives. How wonderful we are to live two lives. We are so good. You should be actors. You should be in an Oscar. When I listen to the lives of people that can look so astoundingly beautiful at home and you can be totally different outside. Because you feel true happiness. There's so many Christians who say, Christian life is so boring. It's so boring. You can kind of see the fun my friends have. Oh, they just love it. They party and get high and they dance and do all kind of things. This is so boring because your mind is not found joy in Jesus Christ. And that's why I said that David said it so beautifully, return unto me, God, the joy of your, my salvation. Okay? But the problem of this is this. One day, I will become like the gods I worship. One day, I'll become like the God I worship. The people I worship, the idols that I worship, the, the guys with those dress sense, and what is it? You can see. I don't care for anything except my selfish life. Peer pressure is a lie that finally becomes the truth in your life. You believe that your everything, your unhappiness, is because you don't get things you want. And that's why most of the young people today are unhappy. Most of the wives today are unhappy because she feels her husband is not good enough. Most of the husbands are unhappy because they feel the wives are not good enough. They feel, oh, you know, I deserve something better, more kinder, more lovelier, more beautiful, but more shapely. And the husband, his wife is thinking, I'm a better guy who takes me for more vacation, more holidays, buys more things for me. And the young guy is unhappy because he feels that I'm not cool enough. I'm missing out on everything. Church is so boring. And this is the most, the peer pressure is a lie that finally becomes a That's why we scale. And I live a life that is chained to a lie. And only... 
In Jesus Christ, can you break this chain? I can assure you, each one of you, you know, when somebody asked, told me last Sunday, you know, I identify so much with your messages. You identify with my messages because I'm going through the same problems myself. I'm not standing here because I've, sol found, I've solved all these issues. Every time when you think you're solved, there's another one that hits you, you know. Just when you think you figured it out, there's another one that comes up to tell you. For us, it could be professional peer pressure. The way I do, the kind of recognition I get in the world, the kind of adulation you get, you can get knocked off from many, many sides. For a moment, I want to look at Mother Teresa. I have the privilege of working in orphanages. I work very closely with the nuns. She always wore a cotton sari. Even in today's money, the value of that sari will not be more than 100 rupees. Three blue stripes. That's all. There's nothing else. She moved on in a rickshaw, had no jewelry, and yet she was the only woman in the world who never had to take an appointment with any president of any nation in the world. She could walk in. When she died, the kind of dignitaries that came down does not happen when the Indian president dies. World leaders, ministers would walk in. If it is logos and clothes and cars and watches and the style that you carried that determines a man, by that she should have been thrown out wherever she went. How great could be a lie? She had no boyfriends. She didn't live in a mansion. She had nothing, just these three saris. With that, the world would bow down to her. And I want you to think of that for a moment. I just want you to pause for a moment. Who are the people that you remember in your life? Who are the people you remember? The one who truly cared for you. I remember my school teacher who cared for me. I'll remember somebody in college who went out of the way to help me. You remember the people who lifted you up when you were truly down. When you were knocked down. When you were doing badly and somebody sat to them and said, let me help you through this journey. Who loved you for who you were. Not for your clothes. Not for the accent of your English. Not for the way you could play the guitar. Or play the drums, you know. All the drummers somewhere in a college used to have a lot of girls interested. I don't know why. You know. Or, do you remember the person who never gave up on you? Very often, children are challenged to love their mothers and fathers because they gave up on them. They told them they were useless. They told them they were failures. They told them that they were an embarrassment. They told them, but yet there was somebody else who never gave up on them. And children remember parents who never gave up on them. You know, there's one thing I used to always tell my son. My son had a problem with learning and difficulties. And he used to flunk in Hindi all the time. And it's so, diff so hard to, I mean, it's amazing to see the transformation in his life now. And those times he'll come and say, Dad, are you embarrassed of me? And every time I'll say, God will never give me the second best in life. You are the best. How often can you tell this story to your child? And these are the things that you remember. Let's come back to the word of God. Jeremiah chapter 2 and 13. My people have committed two sins. He says, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Broken cisterns that cannot hold water. My people, I want to look back. Jesus says, I am the source of living water. Water that flows all the time. Water that quenches your thirst. Water that gives you satisfaction like nothing else. Then Satan came and brought these attractive things because he is the prince of the air. 
the world around you tells you this is not happiness there is no joy in this life you're missing out on fun of the world life is just once if you don't live it you're destroyed you have to change you have to change and people say oh you don't have any friends because you're so boring you know one of the reasons none of my colleagues ever come home for dinner is we don't drink <laughs> it's so boring you know the friends of mine invest so much on liquor when their friends come to show he's got some amazing stuff you're considered boring by many people of the world but you know the truth what your life is and jeremiah says this is the problem and this is god telling my people have committed two sins they have forsaken me they're not trusting me anymore for their happiness they're not trusting me for the source of true joy true peace a peace that passeth all understanding contentment that is beyond all understanding but you have gone to the world which is the broken cistern and this leaking cistern will always dry leave you wanting for more and wanting for more and wanting for more and you can never ever be satisfied broken cisterns that cannot hold water the first question that you could ask yourself is god my first love ecclesiastes 5:10 whoever loves money has never has enough it's a very true thing misers never have money the more you give the more you get i'm not joking the more you start investing in people more you give to people you get more whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with income this too is meaningless if you think that wealth brings you money let me assure you there is more of hatred more of sorrow in hell in wealthy families than not i'm a doctor we see the sick people we see people dying you should see the fight the anger the hatred that goes on in families with money willing to kill each other there is no man who'll say that there was happiness and satisfaction in this i want you to now for a moment go to this beautiful beautiful illustration the story that jesus says one day it was a hot afternoon in the afternoon women don't come to the well they don't come to the well because it's hot wells are a little far off from the village and this was a village in a place called samaria samaria was not a great place it was between two districts galilee on the upper north and judea in the lower south and in between was samaria if you want to go from galilee to judea you never cross samaria because there are no jews there what nebuchadnezzar did is he got all those exiles and put them here from other countries so that israel will never be a land they would rather cross the river jordan go to another province cross that province cross back river jordan and enter galilee so jesus a jew walked down and came to this well this well was called jacob's well it was dug by jacob and still was giving water very symbolic how old jacob was there more than 5000 years 2000 years before jesus christ and the well was a source of water that is still flowing thousands and thousands of years later and as jesus sits there this samaritan woman comes one single woman who did not want to come when other people were there and jesus looks at her and says can you give me some water she was amazed one men generally talk don't talk to women two you don't expect to see a man sitting on the well in the mid of the afternoon and three no jew ever asks a samaritan for water and she says you are a jew and i am a samaritan how can he ask me for a drink for jews do not associate with samaritans that is a beautiful illustration that we talk about god's love we have a god who reaches out for people who are not wanted by anyone even this morning if you feel i have come this morning we pray that you have forgiveness and you remind me again this morning that you are not my first love i feel so wretched god is standing by the side of that well 
the well that you have been going for your joy, for your happiness. I don't know what that well is today for you. Is it money? Is it in the feeling that I should look more beautiful? Is it in pornography? Whatever that well is, Jesus is standing by the side. And he's standing by the side and looking at you come to take water from that well like you do every day because the next day you're thirsty again. And he says, if you knew the gift of God and who is it that asks you for the drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will never thirst again. And whoever, everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks this water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling to eternal life. Just imagine, he says, you will become the source of water. He's saying, drink from the water I give not only will you be satisfied, you will be a source of this living water too, that when others drink of you, they also will be transformed. How beautiful can this be? What is this well that you have been going every day to satisfy your thirst? Many wells? Are we going there every day into the well of materialism? Hoping for satisfaction. And Jesus is standing by the side and say, can I try that too? He never lets her take that well. He never actually drips the, the bucket. He just tells her, do you know, I asked you for water just to start this conversation. Just to let you know, every afternoon in this hot sun, you come hiding from everyone. For water. Where was her source of water? Men. So many men in her life. Hoping that at least one of them would bring her joy. In the emptiness of her life, Jesus meets her. He didn't go to the nicest man in Samaria. He didn't go to the coolest man in Samaria. Or the coolest woman in Samaria. He went to the prostitute of Samaria. Because he knew that she was lonely and she was hungering and she was thirsty for love which the world couldn't give. Many, many times when you talk to a man or a woman who's involved with other people, they talk about the loneliness in their life. You talk about men and boys and girls and why do you get the loneliness in their life? The loneliness because they have not discovered this relationship with somebody who truly loves them. And so they seek for waters, hoping that somehow, could be alcohol, could be drugs, could be pornography, could be any kind of habits in search of popularity or whatever it is. Psalm 16, 11. You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. There is only one place where you can get eternal pressure and that's in Jesus Christ. It is eternal pleasures. It's not pleasure for today. You get high and you come with a hangover tomorrow. No. It's only in Jesus Christ that you can get eternal pressure. And this lie that Satan has told you makes you feel that it is not possible over here. Matthew chapter 6, you know this verse, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness and all these things that you desire. What are you deciding finally? Happiness. What do you decide? Contentment. What do you desire? Peace. And God says all these things will come to your life the day you accept Jesus. He says that it's Toza, one of the greatest, greatest teachers of the word of God. He says, trying to be happy without a sense of God's presence is trying to have a bright day without the sun. Take delight in the Lord and he'll give the desires of your heart. Your desires will change. No longer will these fancy stuff please you anymore. 
Your desire that pleases you and pleases you and only pleases you is to actually do the will of God. You know, when you're in love, I don't know how many of you how many of you fell in love? Don't want to ask that question. But when you fell in love, and Robbie at least, you know, hmm? you want to do everything to please the girl you love. And it's not an effort. It becomes the reason you live is to please her. Once that happens in your life, there's a total transformation. You wake up with excitement to say, what is God talking about me? Consider my son, Job. That's what Jesus said, you know, or God said. And once our focus changes and we fall in love. So in other words, this morning, can you say, God, I want to imitate kindness, love, compassion, patience, a heart to help, and to build others up. Or in one word, God, the secret of happiness is imitating Jesus Christ. Is imitating Jesus Christ. True contentment can only be found in Jesus Christ. He is the source of living waters that does not make you thirst again, right? I just want you to do this this morning. I want you to repeat this after me. I want you to understand that God did not create you to be like a zebra. Everybody looking alike. Everybody in the same dress. Everybody in the same haircut. Everybody looking alike. No, God created you uniquely for a unique purpose in your life. So will you tell after me, I am uniquely created? I don't need to imitate anyone. I'm created to be a blessing to others and uh, true happiness is not found in my looks, in my material things because these things will tarnish and fade. True happiness is becoming like Jesus. We say that true happiness is becoming like Jesus. And Satan has taken us away because of the lie. This afternoon, you got a choice. You want to believe this truth that true happiness is only in Jesus Christ. Or you want to believe a lie that in Christ it's actually boring. The world with its shiny, glittering lights gives me more things. Okay? I close with this. I want the youth to just do a song. I want you to ask this question. Am I like the people Jeremiah talks about? Have I given up the source of living water? Am I looking and running after broken cisterns? I believe this morning God wants to touch everyone. over and over during the worship you heard is Jesus Christ your first love I don't know how many of you this morning feel that he is not your first love how many of you feel this morning God this morning God I want to drink from this source of living water I just want you to stand just raise our hands and say God this morning we heard Lord that I am weak and it's in your strength Father I go but today I don't want to leave this place God unless I'm filled with this water that will remove my hunger and my thirst forever